invite our first speaker, Potak Panjaitan. Um, Potak. Poltak finished his PhD in September 2019 at the Chair of Computer-Aided Architectural Design uh, under the direction of Professor Ludger Hoverstadt at the ETH uh, ITA in Zurich. In 2016, he worked as a project architect for Christian Kieres for the incidental space installation in the Swiss pavilion at the 15th uh, Biennale di Architettura Venezia, 2016. He worked as an architect at Grammatio Kohler Architects in 2014 and received the Tisha Scholarship from the Federal Chancellery of Republic of Austria for Arts and Culture in the same year. From, 2013 to 2000, from 2012 to 2013, he worked as a project architect in Vienna. He studied architecture at the University of Technology Vienna, here in these, in, for maybe even in this room, where he graduated with his architectural studies, where he graduated his architectural studies with honors and the diploma thesis Das Verborgene System in 2011. Thank you, please welcome Potak Panjaitan. Michael, thanks for a kind introduction. And I'm happy to be part of this, this conference. Um, the title of my presentation is Crystalgebra, Architectonic Articulations in Crystal Space. It is mainly about my doctoral thesis, which I've been working on at the ETH Zurich. So without going directly deeper into the description of the title, I will start by giving you an introduction of the common tendency in computational design in architecture. The current research on creating structural objects shows the approach to find complex geometry or procedures and directly trying to translate them as examples in architecture. But the problem is that these abstract concepts often can't be related to the real world or any physicality. To do so, they get superimposed with a notion of materiality. Like in the quote of the French philosopher Lefebvre, nature is imitated for example, but only seemingly reproduced. What are produced are the signs of nature without any appropriation of nature. Trying to find a direct translation and to interpret emerging phenomena one-to-one -to, -one to architecture always has the unavoidable issue that the designated intention to be able to grasp nature is not achieved and the result is only an embodiment of the occurrence. It is the materialization, but instead, it should be the spatialization of the phenomenon. When it comes to differentiate constructed man-made structures and one which result from a natural process, crystals seem to have properties which are ascribed to those of an artificial nature. Crystals grow from the outside through parallel aggregation of matter, whereas organisms, a plant or an animal, grow from the inside. A quote of Monod describes the distinction perfectly. The machine looks at and compares two series of objects. On the one hand, the houses. On the other, on the other hand, rock formations. Utilizing the criteria of regularity, of geometrical simplicity, and of repetition, it will have no trouble deciding that the rocks are natural objects and the houses artifacts. Now the machine examines some pebbles near which it discovers some quartz crystals. According to the same criteria, it should of course decide that while the pebbles are natural, the quartz crystals are artificial objects. A crystal, even though it is so small, is an individual by itself with entirely identical properties of the large one. It is hardly imaginable that such regular structures are possible at all. Therefore, the process of crystallization is fascinating since it does serve the one and at the same time also the other nature. To get a research idea of how to implement spatial concepts in crystal topology, it is necessary to begin with the proposed layout. This research is split into three main domains. This graphical representation shows the reasonable extension of the real geometry by introducing an imaginary part. The real axis stands for the descriptive geometry. It deals with the geometry of space. It represents the current state of research in crystals. 
The imaginary axis is about the topological description of crystals. It is part of the geometric mediation. It covers the mathematical concept of representing abstract topological ideas. Quasi-crystals and their possible variations are representable in the crystal space domain. It is where the knowledge of the two parts provide the setup for a tectonic experience. The diagram implies that the geometry of the crystal is orthogonal to the topology. The plane that spans between these domains is the crystal space. The proposed stages of the crystal space are irrational intermediate conditions between the two fixed axes. These intermediate expressions, they are always coded, and the topological information is then projected into geometry. This diagram is by no means a mathematical representation for the derivation of quasicrystals, but it describes the relationship between the two fixed axes and that the crystal space represents the plane where different articulation can be embedded that cannot be developed in the geometry domain. Geometry of space. Crystals in crystallography are described by idealized areas of geometrical points in space. This perfect infinite alignment of points is called lattice. Because of having perfect translational symmetry, all points of the lattice are equivalent, and each location has the same surrounding neighbors. There are only 14 different ways to arrange points in three-dimensional space, called the Bravé lattice. Each lattice point can then be coupled with a group of atoms or molecules to create a crystal. This unit cell of clustered atoms is arranged in every point of the lattice. The unit cell is described as the basis. Therefore, a Bravais lattice in the combination of a basis illustrates the structural arrangement of a crystal. In 1982, the world of crystallographic science was confused by the discovery of a crystal that has a regular appearance, but on the global scope, it is aperiodic. Multiple patterns surrounds each cell. Professor Schechtmann's discovery of the icosahedral phase with its forbidden fivefold rotational symmetry was condemned for a long time by his colleagues to be impossible. This led to the term quasi-crystal, which defines a structure that has an aperiodic ordering and lacks translational symmetry. In comparison to the regular Bravais lattices, which only need single unit cells for creating an infinite arrangement, the quasi-periodic lattice requires more than one shape to develop. In a periodic layout, it is easy to decode the underlying symmetry of the organization of the two unit cells. But it's much harder to find the present order in a quasi-periodic lattice. The information of the basis is the same, like in the previous picture. They only differ in the order of arrangement of the tiles. But crystals themselves don't represent a descriptive geometry. It only symbolizes the information of multiple coexisting localized spaces without embodying them. The second part covers the geometric mediation. It is about the understanding that the ge geometry of crystals as solid polyhedra is just one visual representation. The information of the speciality lies in the algebraic structure of crystals. However, this topological expression has no explicit body and must first be transformed into a mediative form, a gestalt. To see the crystal code behind is unapparent and to analyze the structure on relational criteria is also not obvious. But instead, we can talk about Toye Ito's Taichung Metropolitan Opera House with its organic minimal surface appearance and link it with the iconic Dom Ino House of Le Corbusier with its parallel horizontal floors to highlight that the spatial organization of these two can be related. The mathematical concept and design method might be different, but they can be set in relation regarding spatial separation and how to combine and orientate spaces in 1981, the mathematician De Bruyne introduced the Cutton project method. With this method, the quasi-periodic pattern can be, can be formed by the projection of a lattice in a higher dimension onto a lower dimensional space. In case of one-dimensional structures, 
the projection of points of a two-dimensional square lattice onto a line creates a sequence of sequ uh, sections. The length of each section on the projection line can only take two values, red and blue. To create a one-dimensional quasi-periodic structure, the slope of the cutting line in relation to the square lattice has to be rational. The raising of the dimensional space exposes the underlying structure of the quasi-crystal and makes a non-periodic order feasible. Considering this, to create a three-dimensional quasi-crystal is to find the location in an arrangement of points in an at least six-dimensional space. Any pattern obtained in this way is either periodic or quasi-periodic, depending on the angle and distances between the arrangements. The approach to crystals, or even quasi-crystals, doesn't go along with the idea to treat the geometry as a mere accumulation of solids. A crystal is built up on the three-dimensional arrangements of UNIGE, which defines the mathematical concept of a lattice. The lattice supplies only the structure that is filled in a crystal by patterns of elements. These bodies of specialities are organized in order to facilitate concepts of space combined with the notion of topological crystals. All these thoughts epitomize a stage for these elements of specialities to find ways for architectonic articulations. These stage plays and experiments are treated in the third part of the research project, the crystal space. With the fundamental knowledge of geometric morphology and syntax from the first part, the geometry of space, combined with the potential to visualize topological spatial ideas from the second with the geometric mediation, there's a possibility to develop crystal space. All these stages are based on the implementation of this algebraic approach and are re-articulated depending on the statement and purpose. It is not a constitution that establishes a system based on a specific logic or rules for joining elements, but it's just the other way around. From the purposeful process, elements can be gained with which it is thinkable to articulate. The goal of the examination of crystals and other structural constitutions is not to resemble or to mimic these crystal arrangements. It is only about the general principle of these formation processes which set a stage play for these characteristic elements of specialities. A quasi-crystal is formed like any other crystal as a formation of atoms in a crystallization process. To better understand the formation process, specific decorations can be developed for crystal units to describe local matching rules. They are called matching rules because the individual units are combined in such a way that the adjacent decoration match with each other. The matching rules direct the units to aggregate in a specific aperiodic order, but unforced and wrong choices can cause building defects. It may also be that the growth can't be continued and the incorrect growth creates dead ends. In three-dimensional three quasi-crystals, there are 16 different rhombohedra with specific decorations to keep the same assembly information like with the two rhombs of the famous Penrose tiling. Matching rules as local growth rules can be assumed as a self-assembly process of natural crystals. But if this is also the case for the intricate growth of real quasi-crystals, is still unknown, but it can give a possible insight of how these decorations can symbolize physical forces. In quasi-crystals, the orientational order is kept at all distances without being repetitive at the same time. The local symmetry is always in sync with the, within the whole structure. It seems that the present defines the nucleus of the crystallization and fixes the locations of the ongoing growth. Since the nature of crystals, and in particular quasi-crystals, are difficult to describe by a specific arrangement of polyhedra, the algebraization of these processes is an, essential, is an essential step in decoupling them from any geometry. This makes it possible for crystals of different crystal classes to communicate with each other. The algebraic structure enables to set two incommensurate periodic crystals equal 
without being constrained by their underlying incompatible geometry and structure. Classifications of crystals are not mutually exclusive in the depicted arrangement, but they are in discourse with each other. It is an embodiment of the so-called in-between, a speciality that is not defined and fixed, but constituted by spanning between them. Determining in-between crystals is not about to identify and to refer them to a specific crystal class. It depends on how to treat and challenge the distinct crystals in order to emphasize their compatible similarity. It is not that one can only be referred to another. It is the correlation of one to many. This opens up a multidimensional space for making these incompatible assumptions. The distinction of crystals and quasicrystals is achieved by relating their shadow symmetries uh, with one another. The crystal keeps the information hidden, and just by putting it under the sun, it shows the encrypted information. The parallel projections unfold the crystal code, which is not apparent through the central perspective. The casting of the shadow reveals the quasicrystal's nature, but only at specific angles. Otherwise, it keeps the information hidden under its noisy appearance. The crystal is a three-dimensional key that incorporates multiple two-dimensional projection patterns. Every quasi-crystal casts a different shadow. It is like a fingerprint encapsulated in a three-dimensional structure in which the code is only accessible through the third, the sun. Just like in the code of Seer, in order to see, we must be able to move according to the new dimension in the course of the projection, the direction accompanied by the rays of the sun. Space becomes a set of possible movements. In a, in a crystal, the regular grid is always visible. To blur the borders of recognizing patterns in the structure even more, the number of distinct elements within the system can be increased till to the particular point where there are no repetitions anymore and all parts are unique. The result is an increase in complexity, but at the same time, the information of the whole model increases as well. The point or ridge of the dissolving visible order is not a transition to disordered chaos, but much more an increase in order towards a quasi-periodic order, where the clear boundaries of subdivisions disappear. These turning points of recognizing patterns are on the one hand an increase in entropy, but on the other also in the complexity of the order. Although the quasi-crystal order in the eye of the observer resembles a disordered arrangement, still more information is required to achieve this highly organized order. The increase in the complexity of order is more toward a negentropic state. The disappearance of clear recognizable patterns is a suitable example for experimenting with the limits of subjective differentiability. For what is described as being natural and emergent is perhaps just a certain degree of complexity that must be exceeded. Crystals of different natures are not directly distinguishable, but the correlation can be determined from the mathematical origin. Like the study of weave patterns, due to the symmetry and complexity, it is also thinkable to look at these patterns by the topology of the knots. Woven textiles can be seen as two-dimensional crystals. It represents a simple binary code, a sequence of up and down movements of the individual threads that recursively repeats itself over and over again. In three dimension, this weave with several thread threads results in a spinning movement of the separate strands. But here too, the quasi-crystal shows that it's literally wired differently. Each thread describes a one-dimensional quasi-crystal. It leads to the fact that its weaving movement is in the rhythm of a non-periodic Fibonacci sequence. Even though each thread follows its rhythm, it remains the aperiodic harmony with all the others. It is a multi-directional articulation in which each thread needs its own story. Weaves based on quasi-crystals and their possible variations are much more differentiated and enable both a regular and a more entangled nature. The simplicity of the single knot with three threads remains, but only the way 
uh, the sequence of order is described is, gives meaning to the structure. There's not one crystal space. It is the articulation and interrelation of multiple ones. What looks like a collision or mixture of crystals is in fact a reconfiguration of space. Any local change relates to the overall and by that the whole information gets rewritten. The rich of distinctness seem to be dissolved, but by that it creates space to deal with this ambiguity. The implication is to appreciate it as a spectrum of multiple configurations. Regularity is interrupted with new formed crystal configurations, and the whole begins to formulate a sequence of spatial expressions. Connections of individual areas characterize the outer shape and gives an insight into the complex branching of the structural organization. All these different crystal formations embody the past time and the process of crystallization. The significance of a building is not only in the finished result, but it is much more about the process of arranging and joining. It describes a sequence of events and it's not just the aggregation of elements. By recognizing patterns in the underlying code of crystal arrangements, regularities and recurring sequences can form single unit cells, as in case of perfect crystals, or several differently shaped ones in composed structures. These recurring patterns can be received as an expression of a language. The individual elements in the codes are like single letters in the alphabet or indices of a finite set. They form separate words, and several words results in a series, which can create a sentence. Just like the sequences of the four different nucleotides expresses the DNA information of cells, code sequences in, crystal, uh, in crystals represents the crystallization instruction for the growth and development. The non-periodic order, um, non-periodic structure act as a language and code. What they both have in common is the meaningfulness in the organization. It seems like they deal with the permutation and combination of a small finite set of basis units in order to create systems of communication. Simple periodic order or complex aperiodicness is embedded in the code. The development of this specificity is equivalent to the structure of a narrative. This act uh, of differentiation of geometry allows a universal abstract system to be understood in different bodies. Just as the architect Waxman explained in his book, the world building should disappear from the vocabulary and be replaced by a word that describes the concept of assembly, that is the art of joining, or better, the art of the joint. Separate parts that are assembled to a whole are so like single words which only makes sense when they are put together. Basically, any technical drawing is due to just three types of lines. It is a combination of straight, concave, and convex lines. It therefore all depends on the way how to combine them. The turning point that separates the concavity and convexity is the inflection point. It is the point where the tangent cuts the curve and the supposed interior changes to the exterior. At these points, it is possible to differentiate between distinct parts without interrupting the continuity and the curves of the curvature. This enables a variety of shapes characterizing a landscape of highs and lows with seamless transi transitions. The evolving composition only gets its expression through the movement. The curse of the cur curvature opens new spaces and completes others. It results in a sequence that represents a geometric diversity without being geometrically complicated. The fragments are linked to a spatial complex that underlines the unit-hole relationship in the process of crystallization. When Professor Schechtmann synthesized the first quasi-crystals in 1982, there was immediately the question how these highly informed crystal structures evolve. So far, there are only three natural occurrences of such quasi-crystals, um, and they all originate from the Katirka region in Siberia. Investigation on the found sample showed that the quasi-crystal 
was confined in a rare polymorph of silicon dioxide formed at 1,200 degrees Celsius by an ultra high pressure of more than 50,000 times of atmospheric one. This knowledge excluded the fact that the sample was synthetic, but led to the next question of which natural environment could meet these extreme requirements. One possibility is that the quasi-crystal was a result of a violent collision of meteoroids in space. This meant that the materialization of quasi-crystals already dated back 4.5 billion years, and that the sample did not come from this planet. Two meteoroids in space collided together, and the forceful impact gave the crystal nucleus the decisive impulse for rearranging its structure. The merged meteor meteoroids redefined its structure by breaking its regular original form to recrystallize under a high dimensional order. The depicted artifact exemplifies the development of the birth of a quasi crystal. The plane cut through the center of the double meteoroid splits the core of the unique event and exposes its constitution. By cutting it at a specific angle, the parts become comparable and the patterns can be read. The cut acts as a plane of reference for deciphering the structure and its visible symmetry. The nature of the double meteoroid was the result of a violent act. The contact point of the two meteoroids reveals the quasi-crystalline core <laughs> structure that is surrounded by many other intermediate states. These in-between structures are essential states in the development of quasi-crystals, which are not seamless transitions between distinct states. They are crystallized moments in the process of reconfiguration. There is still so much to discover in the concept of crystals as characteristic elements of spatialities. It is the principle of the code that already represents a structure which provides a stage for spatial ideas. The description of abstract space on the basis of crystals and that architectural structures are mainly built up of a combination of different spatialities is a sensitization of thinking towards a generic space. From this work, it should be induced how all these ideas can lead to alphabets, where the code of crystals is the articulation of space. It is, it is the demystification of crystals as taxonomies of architectonics. The code represents an idea or process as much as an action building or design. Through the purposive uh, abstraction and translation of specialities, combined with the notion of crystals as a code-like structure, it is possible to scrutinize the meaning of space in order to create new architectonic articulations. It is with this level of abstraction how space should be thought about today. I would like to end my presentation with a short animation of these stage plays.
we have any questions? I can, I can maybe start. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, in your talk, you spoke about crystals and quasi-crystals, mm -hmm. but you have a third form of matter, which is completely amorphous, where mm -hmm. there is no regularity at all. No, no, actually, it's always a combination. So there you can classify them as crystals, which is this perfect alignment of, of, of uh, uh, in the lattice, and the, the specific um, declination of a quasi-crystal with this highly forbidden symmetry and so on. But what I try to propose is that we don't have to think in classes and in classifications, that we can mix them by taking them and making them equal, so by yeah. setting them equal. Yeah. This point I understood, but I in matter, you, you have crystals, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. quasi-crystal and totally amorphous matter, yeah, yeah. like glass, for instance. Yeah, yeah. So I understand that going from crystal to quasi-crystal is introducing more complexity, let's say, in a building or in a... Yeah, if, if, if but we why yeah. not going to completely amorphous? So if we stay in this kind of realm of classification, yeah, there are these kind of two free classes, if we would say. But there is always a state in between. But this kind of state in between is really hard to talk about because neither it belongs to this kind of class and so on. What I try to propose is that we get rid of this kind of classification of the system and that we try to find uh, the properties in or, or embrace the beauty of the in-between. So even between quasi-crystals and then to, um, I wouldn't say that there is a, a line between, that there is a transition between crystals, quasi-crystals and amorphous, they all are separate. And uh, there is a space in between. And I think this kind of space is the space for this kind of articulations, what, which I mean. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, maybe one question regarding the application or the implementation of yeah. such a strategy. I would be interested maybe if you can share some thoughts about um, if you have thought about uh, the, a social layer or a political layer to this approach. Yeah. Like, um, I think th the beauty in it is that I don't want to propose a way how to do stuff. So, so, so because uh, all these kind of different experiments, they are all, they are all distinct, but in, in one point they are all the same because they all deal with specialities, structures, and so on. But it really depends on the articulation. So it it's really depends on your imagination, how to use this kind as a vehicle to propose different kind of uh, proposals. So as you mentioned, what is about political here and so on, yeah, it could benefit from that, but it really depends on how you see them, so. So part of the strategy is to leave it open. Yeah, for totally. Okay. So it's a way how I actually, to, to think about space. And then it really depends on the matter how you want to address it, and if this is possible in, this, in, in the crystal space. Maybe getting, starting from your question and, and from your answer, um, uh, I'd like actually to know if there is um, a interrelation between, uh, and there must be in a way, between this, um, this articulation that you made mm -hmm. Uh, and your practice as an architect. So uh, what, maybe the politics can be found there more, more subjectively, or maybe not. No. Yeah, for, sh for sure, for sure, but it really, so it really depends on what is your purpose. Uh, this is, it's always, it always needs a purpose to have an articulation. So, um, and for me, it, it's more about that you try to get rid of this kind of classification system that there are these kind of structures and these kind of structures and everything in between is more like a merge and collision of, of things. That, but here I want to say that even if they are not compare, uh, you cannot, you cannot uh, merge them together, there is still a space uh, where they can have a discourse. 
And the discourse is not about uh, finding a, um, finding um, something which which uh, where they are similar. It's more where they build up a consensus. And so I don't know if you can if how to relate this into into social thinking or politics, but I think to find the consensus and not finding the similarities, maybe this could be a way how to address these kind of problems. Yes, uh, thanks, thanks for the presentation. It's really quite astonishing uh, piece of work you presented today. Um, I was wondering whether y y you touched upon uh, chemistry. Yeah, mm -hmm. especially in the formation of crystals. And I was wondering if it's been or will it be part of your research to start introducing, let's say, other concerns about matter, which are not necessarily uh, all about geometry. For instance, uh, I think that when you work with colors in your, in your work, th the work takes an incredible dimension, mm -hmm. um, which I found really, really fascinating. So anyway, uh, the question is whether other elements about matter, which is not just geometrical articulation, yeah. can or will uh, be absorbed or, or will be looked at. Yeah, of course, because if I started with, the, when I discovered this for me, I was fascinated. I have some imagination of recreating some, some new materials where the properties is more a transition between fixed states, a quasi-crystal metal, which has the property of, um, of having a non-sticky uh, surface, which, which somehow uh, there is a transition into a normal structure like metal, um, where everything, all the properties are in the, in, the, in the same thing, only by changing its, its regularity, it, it can achieve different kind of properties. For sure, these kind of things were all in my imagination, but when I first talked with my uh, co-examinator about, uh, um, about my fantasies, he said, uh, actually, it's not that easy because, actually, it is possible because you can actually, um, you can freeze different atoms at specific uh, po positions, but it's on a, on a different scale. It's like on atoms, really sl uh, small scale, but theoretically, it's possible, yeah. And then there is, uh, it's not a layering anymore, it's, it's a, re, a reconfiguration of properties within the structure. And this is, a f yeah, I find totally fascinating. I would like to, um, to ask you to elaborate a little bit because there is a super interesting turn in your, in your way of approaching the crystals. So you say at one point it's about demystifying the crystals, whereas when we hear you speak about the crystal space, which is to be able to produce a common sense and to do all these things, to provide stages and to be narrative, mm -hmm. then a lot of, yeah, so, so a first, a first uh, inclination might be that actually you are mystifying crystals. So how <laughs> you are understanding uh, th yeah. uh, uh, this relation, that would be very nice yeah. to hear a bit more about. Okay, so, but de demystifying is about that we have a certain opinion, we have a certain thought about when we talk about crystals and architecture, there are always these kind of pictures in mind, how it should be and how, it, how this is related to architecture. So, but what I try to propose is that there is no geometry, there is nothing, it's only the way how you structure. And it all depends on the information, how to deal, it's more like a black box. It's not about classifying, it's about finding similarities, how to share them, how to combine them, and how to build up this space for conversations. And um, demystification uh, means in, in that way that we have to get rid of like, all these kind of um, sciences, natural sciences, that it's about classifying, it's about uh, understanding the properties and so on and so on. But as mentioned before, is what if everything is like, it's it's a common ground, it's, it's a fluid space where you have this kind of different kind of notions and they all somehow are mixing and they are overlapping and they still project shadow. So. Maybe one more question. Uh, I'm also astonished by your presentation, thank you. Um, um, and has to do with the other questions, but it's more my ignorance, really mm -hmm. speaking. Um, I, I wonder, I mean, in some ways you seem to equate crystals with space. 
So that's, in, in a way, they're equivalent, mm. if you see what I mean. And then, the, and, then, and then crystals are solid. So I'm wondering, yeah. so you've been talking about the fluidity, but the fluidity is really transitioned between states of solidity. So I'm wondering, could we have something similar for sort of liquid or gaseous uh, structures that are in the process of movement? Mm. So they don't kind of freeze into concretized structures, but ra rather, yeah. yeah? Yeah, why not? Because it's about, about sharing space, it's about defining space, it's like, it's, it's the aggregation of, of atoms, of specialities, and they all make space. It's, I think this is the definition of space, that we, we share, as a, if there are two, then we create space by setting up two against each other. So, and, and this dual space is, this is in, or multiple, multiple space, this is for me the most, uh, this is for me super interesting because it is defining space without, without geometry. Only by setting two information, it's already created space. And if we are, we are, and then 